Hello, everyone. I'm Billy. And I'm Kamran. Welcome to the Horse Frog Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors and the creators of the Malazan Brotherhood. Today, we will be discussing Book 4, Chapter 20 of Dead House Gates, a novel in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. This is Part 3 of our coverage of this chapter. This podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the books set in the Malazan universe. It's not a book review, and it is most definitely not intended to be a replacement to reading the books. Both Billy and I know Preach. this to be the best fantasy story ever written and want to share our love of the series with you. We will be covering the events of the books in a linear fashion. There'll be spoilers for those that have not read the books, so we'll try not to spoil anything prior to us covering that portion of the respective books. But that ship's already sailed. Drop minor sports did. I just keep doing it. Mm -hmm. So, again, it's just minorly sorry, but I'm not sure where we actually stand on days without incident at this point. But uh, I think we're at one. One. Righteous. Okay. <laughs> Let's see if I can make it through the day. <laughs> <laughs> Quick warning. Today's episode contains – wait, does it have violence? Kind of. Um <laughs> harrowing tensions <laughs> it's it's rather overwrought tension I don't, I don't know a quick warning today's episode <laughs> is very tense in nature those that are anxiety riddled be warned <laughs> listener discretion is advised and our show is listener supported if you'd like to support us we'd really appreciate that and we really mean that not like other malazan podcasters you know who you are and I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. I digress. If you'd like to uh, show us your love and support, you can do so by visiting our Patreon link on our website at horsefrogproductions.com. Currently, we're posting ad-free episodes on Patreon weekly. Also, we'd really like to hear from you. Send any feedback or comments to contact at horsefrogproductions.com. All right. Chapter 20, part three. We pick up the chapter with Duiker and the Chain of Dogs. Balan Village was a squalid collection of low mudbrick houses, home to perhaps 40 residents, all of whom had fled days earlier. The only structure less than a century old was the Malazan arched gate that marked the beginning of the Aran Way, a broad, raised military road that had been constructed at Dasim Ultors. Dasim Ultor. <laughs> <laughs> Command it's early in the conquest. It's been a while. <laughs> no, it's been one week. We had it Has last it been week. One week? Yes, yes. <laughs> Deep ditches flanked the Aaron Way, and beyond them were high, flat topped earthen banks on which grew for the entire 10 mile stretch and in two precise rows tall cedars that had been transplanted from Galeen on the Clatar Sea. And I have such a clear picture of Aaron Way banked by these perfectly planted trees in my mind. I agree. Especially what 10 miles, dude, is just to this perfect precision. It's quite a feat of engineering, yes. I think. You got 10 miles with all these banks off on the side and this raised road and everything. Yeah. The Quran spokeswoman joined Duiker, Nil, and Nether in the wide concourse before the Way's Gate. She said, Payment has been received and all agreements between us honored. Duiker said, We thank you, Elder. The Elder shrugged and said, A simple transaction, soldier. No words of thanks are necessary. Duiker said, true, not necessary, but given in any case. The elder said, then you are welcome. Duiker said, the empress will hear of this, elder, in the most respectful of terms. Her steady eyes darted away at this. She hesitated, then said, soldier, a large force approaches from the north. Our rear guard has seen the dust. They come swiftly. Duiker said, ah, I see. The elder said, perhaps some of you will make it. Durker said, we'll better that if we can. The elder said, soldier? Durker said, I, elder? The elder asked, are you certain Aaron's gates will open to you? Durker's laugh was harsh. He said, I'll worry about that when we get there, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's a problem for future Durker to deal with. Absolutely. Yeah, dude, this is kind of a one foot in front of the other scenario here. <laughs> oh, yeah. The elder said, there's wisdom in that. She nodded, then gathered her reins and said, goodbye, soldier. Duerker said, farewell. The Quran Dobri departed in less than five minutes, the wagons under heavy escort. Duerker eyed what he could see of the refugee train, their presence overwhelming Balan's boundaries. He'd set a difficult, grueling pace, a day and a night with but the briefest pauses for rest, and the message had clearly reached them, one and all, that safety would be assured only once they were within Aaron's massively fortified walls. He thought, Three leagues left. It'll take us until dawn to achieve that. Each league I push them hard slows those that follow. Yet what choice do I have? Duerker said, Nil, inform your Wiccans. I want the entire train through this gate before the sun's set. Your warriors are to use every means possible to achieve that, short of killing or maiming. The refugees may have forgotten their terror of you. 
remind them. Another said, there are but 30 in the troop, and all youths at that. Dworker said, angry youths, you mean. Well, let's offer them an outlet. <laughs> Those poor refugees. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> they just can't catch a break. Yeah, so close, though. Ugh. Aaron Way accommodated them in their efforts for the first third, locally known as Ramp, was a gentle downward slope toward the plain on which the city sat. Cone-shaped hills kept pace with them to the east and would do so to within a thousand paces of Aaron's north wall. The hills were not natural. They were mass graves, scores of them, from the misguided slaughter of the city's residents by the Talan I mass in Kelonved's time. The hill nearest Aaron was among the largest, and was home to the city's ruling families and the Holy Protector and Philodan. This event where the Talani mass slaughtered the citizens of Aaron has been mentioned before. To have this many barrows certainly fleshes out the magnitude of that massacre. Three leagues of hills flanking Aaron Way. That's a lot of bodies. Yes. Ought to be pretty fertile soil. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that does paint a really... I'm assuming the Malazans came here and kind of built this as a memorial kind of to what happened here, this roadway, right? Is that what when they established their rule? It's a good question because I don't know historically why these big parade roads were built because oh, it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't. But one thing I was curious, I forgot. Do you think it's that maybe it could they they may be using part of one of those old we remember we found some of those old, weird, ancient straight road first empire straightways. You know, those real straight roadways and some of them yeah. had water flowing underneath them. I wonder if they're using part of one of those roads. Maybe that's one of these cities because it was it was the holy protector here that was killed originally in Aaron. So maybe they were using some of those old roadways or something like that. Maybe that's why it's so straight. It's possible. But when I think of those roads, they generally run to something. And Balan doesn't seem the most important destination. You know, it's a no. small village of 40 people. And then from there you go to Aaron. If it is an old road, it would explain why traveling with somebody might set up shop and they want to make a little small outpost not too far from the city, mm -hmm. you know, or something like that. Possibly. I don't know. Yeah, it kind of makes you wonder if they planned on actually making this longer to actually connect some of the larger cities and so. they never got around to it or something. Yeah. Duerker left Nil to lead the vanguard and rode at the very rear of the train, where he, Nether, and three Wiccans shouted themselves hoarse in an effort to hasten the weakest and slowest among the refugees. It was a heartbreaking task, and they passed more than one body that had given out at the pace. There was no time for burial, nor the strength to carry them. That would be so difficult, trying to drive these poor people on the verge of death, than having them fall without the ability to do anything to help them. Yes, and this makes this part very hard to read it's harsh and it's not difficult writing i mean the writing is beautiful it's just very hard to read these people have pushed through so long so far so long and so close and just to not make it that last bit has got to be just uh, awful yeah and then for the people that are leaving them behind the desperation it shows panicked flight yeah absolutely to the north and slightly east of the train the clouds of dust grew steadily closer nether gasped they're not taking the road Wheeling her mount around to glare at the dust, she said, They come overland, slower, much slower. Dworker said, But a shorter route on the map. Nether said, The hills aren't marked, are they? Dworker said, No, non imperial maps show it as a plain. The barrows are too recent in addition, I'd guess. Nether said, You'd think Corbolo would have a Malazan version. Dworker said, It appears not, and that alone may save us, lass. Yet he could hear the false ring in his own words. The enemy was too close, less than a third of a league away, he judged. Even with the burial mounds, mounted troops could cover that distance in a few score minutes. Man, less than a mile away, they're getting close. And yeah. the tension just keeps building here. Oh, I know it. I know it's coming, and I'm still just get ramped up when we get talking about it, because it is so tensely, so beautifully done. But that is a stroke of luck that those hills are there to impede yeah. some of the movement by the army. Yeah, very much. Faint Wiccan war cries from the vanguard reached them. Nether said, They've sighted Aaron. Nil shows me through his eyes. Dworker asked, The gates? She frowned, then said, Closed. Dworker cursed. He rode his mare among the stragglers. He shouted, The city's been sighted! Not much more! Move! From some hidden, unexpected place, reserves of energy rose in answer to Dworker's words. He sensed, then saw a ripple run through the masses, a faint quickening of pace, of anticipation, and of fear. 
Duerker twisted in his saddle. The cloud loomed above the cone-shaped mounds. Closer, yet not as close as it should have been. Duerker shouted, Nether, are there soldiers on Aaron's walls? Nether said, Aye, not an inch to spare. Duerker asked, The gates? Nether said, No. Duerker asked, How close are we up there? Nether said, A thousand paces. People are running now. Duerker said, What in Hood's name is wrong with them? And that's not a good sign. What type of high fist would leave the citizen refugees of his own empire to die outside the city's walls at the hands of the enemy? I believe I have let slip that Porn Qual is, and I quote, a real piece of crap. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think I think I may be uh, vindicated in that statement here. So, Yeah, it's got to be real tough to have to obey those orders. Oh, yeah. Duger stared again at the dust cloud and shouted, Fainer's hoof! Nether, take your Wiccans, ride for Aaron. Nether asked, what about you? Duerker said, to hood with me, damn you, go, save your children. She hesitated, then spun her horse around. She barked at the Wiccan youth, you three, with me. He watched them drive their weary horses forward along the edge of the way, sweeping past the stumbling, pitching refugees. The train had stretched out, those fleeter of foot slipping even farther ahead. The elderly surrounded Duerker, each step a tortured struggle. Many simply stopped and sat down on the road to await the inevitable. Duerker screamed at them, threatened them, but it was no use. He saw a child, no more than 18 months old, wandering lost, arms outstretched, dry-eyed and appallingly silent. Duerker rode close, leaned over in his saddle and swept the child into one arm. Tiny hands gripped the torn fragments of his shirt. That's terrible, that poor kid. Yes, it is. A last row of mounds now separated Duerker and the tail end of the train from the pursuing army. The flight had not slowed, and that was the only evidence Duerker had that the gates had at last opened to receive the refugees. He thought, either that or they're spreading out in frantic, hopeless waves along the wall. But no, that would be a betrayal beyond sanity. And now he could see, a thousand paces away, Aaron. And that's amazing that they actually made it all the way. What an incredible feat for Coltane and the Seventh and the Wicked. Oh, I know it. Uh, this is, boy, I can't say a whole lot more than yes. I was going to say something, but it's it's going to be spoilers, so I can't say anything. It's absolutely amazing that they've made it this far, and yeah, that, that, that there's anybody left alive at all. You expect one or two survivors. You know, this is more than one or two survivors. I'm not sure how many it is, but, you know. Probably about 30,000. I mean, they probably yeah, lost some on this last march, but not. They didn't lose them all. It's all the refugees were kept safe, except for the ones that died of exhaustion and give up. Mm -hmm. For the most part. So that's an amazing feat. It is. Dude. The north gates, flanked by solid towers, yawned for three quarters of their height. The last lowest quarter was a seething mass of figures, pushing, crowding, clambering over each other in their panic. But the tide's strength was too great, too inexorable to stop her that passageway. Like a giant maw, Aaron was swallowing the refugees. The Wiccans rode at either side, desperately trying to contain the human river, and Duerker could now see among them soldiers in the uniform of the Aaron City garrison joining in the effort. At least the gates finally opened to receive them. I don't even want to think about the crushing weight placed on the refugees as they pass through that gate. Talk about yeah. getting trampled. Oh, I know what that would be. And the other thing is, is I'm, I kind of, for a minute there, I thought they weren't going to open. It's like, oh my, oh my word, they're going to open. And they finally do. Yeah, they, the, so that everyone's got bottlenecked up here real bad. The way he wrote it, it was a little confusing at first because – until he said that the city guards were among them, receiving them, it almost sounded like people were just piling up at the gate, you know, because the yeah. last he heard, the gate was closed. Yes. Just a good sign that they opened it finally. Yep, finally. Waited for them to get right to the gate. If they'd opened it before, maybe some, they could have alleviated some of this because people would have been trickling in. Mm -hmm. Duerker thought, and the army itself, the High Fist's army, they stood on the walls. They watched. Row upon row of faces, figures jostling for a vantage point along the north wall's entire length. Resplendently dressed, individuals occupied the platforms atop the towers flanking the gates, looking down at the starved, bedraggled, screaming mob that thronged the city entrance. City garrison guards were suddenly among the last of those refugees still moving. On all sides around Duerker, he saw grim-faced soldiers pick people up and carry them at a half-jog toward the gates. Spotting one guardsman bearing the insignia of a captain, Duerker rode up to him and shouted, You! Take this child! 
the man reached up to close his hands around the silent, wide-eyed toddler. The man asked, are you Duiker? Duiker said, aye. The man said, you're to report to the high fist immediately, sir. There, on the left-hand tower. Duiker growled, that bastard will have to wait. I will see every damned refugee through first. Now run, captain, but tell me your name, for there may well be a mother or father still alive for that child. The man said, Kenneb, sir, and I will take care of the lass until then. I swear it. And Kenneb appears again. It's great yes. to have him back in the story. Yes, welcome back, and good to see a familiar face, especially at a time like this. Kind of takes a little bit, okay, now we, we have a face of somebody that we can trust. I think that's done deliberately, don't you? So we know somebody, so that we feel this way. I'm not sure what his motivation was to reintroduce him at this point, because the last time we saw him, Kalam had left him in Aaron after they came through the Imperial Warren. So he was supposed to go find the city guard and join up with them or something. But that's been a long time. A lot of time has passed since then, so. Yeah. Kenneb then hesitated, freed one hand, and gripped Duerker's wrist. He said, sir? Duerker asked, what? Kenneb said, I'm... I'm sorry, sir. Duerger said, your loyalties to the city you've sworn to defend, Captain. Kenneb said, I know, sir, but those soldiers on the walls, sir, well, they're as close as they're allowed to get, if you understand me, and they're not happy about it. Duerger said, they're not alone in that. Now get going, Captain Kenneb. And I am glad to hear that this doesn't sit well with the soldiers stuck inside the city. Where is that knife in the back when you need it? Now, this is a question I have. In response to that, is that the Malazan military's way of always handling it? Or does that specifically have to do with the Bridge Burners group? <laughs> were they the ones that were particularly motivated to, um, say, take care of leadership issues? That's a good point. Maybe that was the influence of the old guard and the people they put in place back when <laughs> the Bridge Burners and some of these other individuals, not necessarily Bridge Burners, but from that era, right. were brought through training. Maybe it was a different culture back then where they're allowed right. to think for themselves and not just yes men or women. Oh, you know, that always reminds me of Full Metal, you know, in Full Metal Jacket when they say, we're not, we, you know, we're, we're trying to make killers here. We're not, trying, we're not trying to make machines. We want killers. You know? <laughs> we, want, we want free thinking killers kind of deal. He's like, yeah, that's what, they, <laughs> that's what they're doing here, man. <laughs> Duiker was the last. When the gate finally emptied, not a single breathing refugee remained outside the walls, barring those he could see well down the road, still seated on the cobbles, unable to move, drawing their last breaths too far away to retrieve. And it was clear that the Aaron soldiers had been given strict orders about how far beyond the gate they were permitted. Thirty paces from the gate, and with the array of guards standing in the gap watching him, Duerker wheeled his horse around one final time. He stared northward first to the dust cloud now ascending the last largest barrow, then beyond it, to the glittering spear that was the whirlwind. His mind's eye took him farther still, north and east, across rivers, across plains and steppes, to a city on a different coast. Yet the effort availed him little, too much to comprehend, too swift, too immediate this end to that extraordinary soul-scarring journey. He thought, a chain of corpses, hundreds of leagues long. No, it is all beyond me beyond i now believe any of us he swung his horse around eyes fixing on that yawning gate and the guards gathered there they parted to form a path Duerker tapped his heels into the mare's flanks he ignored the soldiers on the wall even when the triumphant cry burst from them like a beast unchained and what a tension-filled segment of the chain of dogs this would be such a great episode in a show you could really play up the tension of the approaching army with the refugees desperately trying to go through the gates as the dust cloud approaches them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this could be, like you said, for the whole episode, for a whole 45 minutes to an hour, this could be, the tension could be milked on this one big time. Yeah. And righteously so, because it would take them a while to get all these people through here, and it would be that tense. Yeah. Waiting for death to come smash you through there like a meat grinder. They survived a meat grinder of a trip. Mm hmm <laughs> And then a final shot of Duerker silhouetted through the, like, so you're in the shade of the gate and yes. you see his silhouette on the other side as he turns around and looks at those, man. Yeah. I got chills, man. Yeah. I'm telling you, dude, this would be such a great show. Oh, my word. Yes. The best. <laughs> it would be the best. With the right yeah. writers and directors. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's, there, there's the problem. <laughs> we are taken somewhere else. Shadows flowed in silent waves over the barren hills. Apt's glittering eyes scanned the horizon for a moment longer, then she dipped her elongated head to look down on the boy crouched beside her forelimb. 
He too was studying Shadow Realm's eerie landscape, his own single multifaceted eye glistening beneath the jutting brow ridge. After a long moment, he lifted his head and met her gaze. He said, Mother, is this home? A voice spoke from a dozen paces away. My colleague ever underestimates this realm's natural inhabitants. Ah, there is the child. The boy turned and watched the tall, black-clad man approach. The man continued, Aptorian, your generous shaping of this lad, no matter how well meant, will do naught but scar him within in the years to come. Apt clicked and hissed a reply. The man said, Ah, but you have achieved the opposite, lady, for he now belongs to neither. Apt spoke again. The man cocked his head, regarded her for a long moment, then half smiled. He said, Presumptuous of you. His gaze fell to the boy, then he said, Very well. He crouched and said, Hello. The boy returned the greeting shyly. Casting a last irritated glance at Apt, the man offered the child his hand. He said, I'm Uncle Cotillion. So I take this to mean that Apt was telling him to be nice to the boy or introduce himself or something. <laughs> I know it. Well, just imagine the nerve. <laughs> Man, she's pretty aggressive in her demands because she got Shadow Throne to save yeah. all those kids that were crucified. Yeah. <laughs> and now she's telling Cotillion what to do. <laughs> I love it. I, I love her. She's fantastic. <laughs> I'm assuming she's acting very motherly. I don't know what she's really saying. She could be saying horrible things. Maybe they're saving them for her dinner for later. I don't know. Oh, okay. but, uh, <laughs> but I find it intriguing, though. In response to Cotillion, the boy said, you can't be. Cotillion said, oh, and why not? The boy said, your eyes, they're different. So small, two fighting to see as one. I think they must be weak. When you approached, you walked through a stone wall and then the trees, rippling the ghost world as if ignorant of its right to dwell here. Cotillion's eyes widened. He said, wall? Trees? He glanced up at Apt and asked, has his mind fled? The demon answered at length. Cotillion paled. Finally, he muttered, Hood's breath. When he turned back to the child, it was with an expression of awe. The boy sees with unnatural vision. What an interesting development. I'd like to hear what Apt said that made Cotillion pale like that. Oh, I know it. I just love how we're just constantly kept in the dark about what she said. I, I like one-sided conversations in a way. You have to, it's all from implication of what did she say? I, I, I'm dying to know. <laughs> yeah. It's cool though. I don't even know how you'd write it to where you could understand what it was saying, you know? Yeah. yeah it, I don't either. I like the way this scene plays out though. Oh, yeah. This, the fact that he's able to write such weird entities that we become interested in, not just the human ones, but, you know, you've got Rake, which is humanoid, but, you know, quite probably the oldest person alive, I'm assuming, on this world. And then you've, you know, but there are so many interesting non humans, but you have some kind of glimpse into them, and at least they speak our language or something. So we have some idea. Here, she's like, I got no idea what's going on here. I don't even know if I want to know. It, we... <laughs> Cotillion asked, what's your name, lad? The boy said, panic. Cotillion said, you possess one then. Tell me, what else, apart from your name, do you recall of your other world? Panic said, I remember being punished. I was told to stay close to father. Cotillion asked, and what did he look like? Panic said, I don't remember. I don't remember any of their faces. We were waiting to see what they'd do with us. But then we were led away, the children, away. Soldiers pushed my father, dragged him in the opposite direction. I was supposed to stay close, but I went with the children. They punished me, punished all of the children for not doing what we were told. Cotillion's eyes narrowed. He said, I don't think your father had much choice, Panic. Panic said, but the enemy were fathers too, you see, and mothers and grandmothers. They were also angry with us. They took our clothes, our sandals. They took everything from us. They were so angry. Then they punished us. And this statement, but the enemy were fathers too, you see, mm -hmm. and mothers and grandmothers, it hits me pretty hard. Yeah, I could see how that would. But you've got to remember that's just, you know, any opposing army is going to have that too. Because, I mean, I'm assuming this was done by this was Shaikh's group, right? Or was it this was, yeah. So they, but... Again, 
some of these folks do some, you know, war people do horrible, stupid things and awful things in a war. And I don't know why, the, but the kids are the, probably the first in, to suffer the worst, I'm assuming. Yeah, well, I don't think everybody acts like that in a war. I don't think so either. Because, you know, this statement, it's a reminder to me that at the end of the day, all of us are humans and we have parents and we may have siblings or children. Uh-huh. And with the exception of some small percentage of the population that has some type of dark triad trait or mental illness where they don't care about other people. I imagine that we all want to protect our families. Yeah. And when we start looking at people as the enemy because they don't share our beliefs, then it's a slippery slope to ending up in a situation like the one that we're talking about here in this book sure. where you're dehumanizing. And then at that point, you're not looking at them like children anymore. It's some object that yeah. is on the other side. Nicely stated, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Cotillion asks, and how did they do that? And this is in reference to the punishment. Panic said, they nailed us to crosses. Cotillion said nothing for a long moment. When he finally spoke, his voice was strangely flat. He said, you remember that then? Panic said, yes. And I promise to do as I'm told from now on. Whatever mother says, I promise. And that's some serious trauma right there. This kid has. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's very sad. I mean, these because it wasn't just crucified. They had their eyes put out. Other things was oh, awful. And, uh, yeah, that was one of the uh, worst things we saw in this book. It is, and but at least he's got a mother now. I mean, as weird as she might be, but at least she cares for this boy. Or, I'm sorry, she appears to care. For him. <laughs> she healed him and, and mm-hmm. got him a place to stay. So that's, it says something. It's almost a weird thing. It's almost like you find humanity from the least human thing here that begs the question do you have to be human to have humanity yeah. and maybe it's not even humanity it's just compassion yeah and, and, that's, and that's exactly i guess what it gets to because i love that it reminds me of hitchhiker's guy when they talk about the direct humanity vogonity oh, sorry the voganity sorry <laughs> different races <laughs> it's like, you know. <laughs> so yeah i think that's being able to have empathy and to care for other things that can't take to you know to feel sympathy i think and empathy is kind of a very, you know, very human thing. That's actually a good thing. You kind of see this behavior with some other animals. Yeah. I think like whales in particular definitely are capable of this. Some of the primates definitely capable of this. Yes. Well, I, I watch videos all day long of some, you know, monkey saving kitties or, you know, dog saving you know, people, you know, animal mammals will do things to help other mammals out sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really wild to see. So yeah. Cotillion said, panic, listen carefully to your uncle. You weren't punished for not doing what you were told. Listen, this is hard, I know, but try to understand. They hurt you because they could, because there was no one there who was capable of stopping them. Your father would have tried, I'm sure he did, but like you, he was helpless. We're here now with you, your mother, and Uncle Cotillion. We're here to make sure you'll never be helpless again. Do you understand? Panic looked up at his mother. She clicked softly. Panic said, all right. Cotillion said, we'll teach each other, lad. Panic frowned and asked, what can I teach you? Cotillion grimaced and said, teach me what you see here in this realm, your ghost world, the shadow hold that was, the old places that remain. Panic said, what you walk through unseeing. Cotillion said, I, I've often wondered why the hounds never run straight. Panic asked, hounds? Cotillion said, you'll meet them sooner or later, Panic cuddly mutts one and all <laughs> right about as cuddly as a porcupine oh yeah but imagine they might be kind of sweet with kids you never get to <laughs> maybe they like kids <laughs> <laughs> i don't know kids they don't know the limits and they always push it too far and then yes. you're talking about some type of primal elemental I- beast <laughs> <laughs> Accidentally kills all children because in, in a fit of rage because they pulled it too hard on his tail. It's something along those lines. <laughs> Destroys a city because. <laughs> Panic oh. smiled, revealing sharp fangs. He said, I like dogs. You like dags? Sorry. <laughs> dags? So sorry. Dag, 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 yeah, dags. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. A little snatch there. Oh, With a slight flinch, Cotillion said, I'm sure they'll like you in turn. He straightened and faced apt. He said, you're right. You can't do this alone. Let us think on it, Eminus and I. He faced panic again and said, your mother has other tasks now, debts to pay. Will you go with her or come with me? 
Panic asked, where do you go, uncle? Cotillion said, the other children have been deposited nearby. Would you like to help me get them settled? Panic hesitated, then replied, I would like to see them again, but not right away. I will go with mother. The man who asked her to save us needs to be looked after. She explained that. I would like to meet him. Mother says he dreams of me, of when he first saw me. Cotillion muttered, I'm sure he does. Like me, he is haunted by helplessness. Very well, until we meet again. I really like this. This it reveals that Cotillion slash the rope knows Kalam. And I wonder if that's just part of being an ascendant that knows another assassin because he is the patron of assassins. Yeah, it's hard to say because they had presumably some prior knowledge of each other. Kalam was famous within the Claw, and yeah. he was the head of the Claw, Cotillion. Yes. And so I'm assuming he's really aware of him and his abilities. But like I said, I'm curious if he's more aware of him now mm -hmm. and this form. Cotillion shifted his attention one last time, stared long into App's eye. He said, when I ascended, lady, it was to escape the nightmares of feeling. He grimaced and went on. Imagine my surprise that I now thank you for such chains. I had this highlighted from a prior read through. And you and I have spoken a number of times on how Sari seems so cruel and bloodthirsty and not at all in alignment with this cotillion we see here. Yes. And this experience is evidence of how he is changing. It is. And one of the wonderful things about reading Steven Erickson that he does is he shows growth in characters. Who does that? I've read so many fantasy shows where you're just following the same knucklehead through the same, you know, he's the same guy. Nothing has changed for him. Just the circumstances change each episode kind of deal. No, this is, these people have real growth. And I mean, good gracious. And, and the fact that you see this growth from Cotillion, yeah, it says an awful lot to me. Cause, but, but what that, that quote to me in particular makes me almost feel like he's actually always been very more caring than he's let on, but he just didn't ever want to feel because his job requires him, his job is all about killing. Mm. I'm going to challenge you on other writers not portraying growth. Paul Atreides or Duncan Idaho? Uh, okay. Uh, no, okay. I'm sorry. Now, I'm, I'm, not talking, I'm not talking about the big three. I'm not like talking Tolkien, Herbert, or, or even Heinlein. Some guys, you know, that are kind of like the granddaddies of really good, you know, so, the guys that came up with all the ideas that were now, you know, siphoning off for the rest of our lifetimes, apparently. But most of the modern genres don't have a lot of growth. I mean, you had, like I said, a lot of those guys did, but a lot of the stuff I've read in between does not necessarily have a lot of character growth because it's not as character driven, I don't think. It tends to be more event driven. Mm, I guess point. that might be the thing because he does, he just, his blending of everything to get, I, I, I just don't get it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I, I can usually appreciate certain things from writers going, I can appreciate how he does X, Y, and Z, but it's like, dude, I appreciate how this guy does, I appreciate how he writes so, everything, even his small sentences. It's like, dude, wow. <laughs> I'm, I'm always so mind blown with this guy. Yeah. It's also nice to see some of the gods in the book acting differently than some bored, petulant children. I'm thinking mm -hmm. of Opan in this case. Yeah. And I, I, some of this, and I've not thought about this a lot of this until just really right now, is that this whole time, so many of the, all the ascendants and elder things that we meet, you know, they're pretty old and even ancient. But uh, Shadowthorn and Rope, or the art, wouldn't you say these are the newest fellas on those, you know, the new kids on the block, per se? So they, they have most of their humanity intact. So it's not been burned out by centuries of ennui and this childishness. Mm hmm. Yeah, they're the newest that we've met, for sure. Yes, right. So maybe that has something to do with why they were still more willing to be. And well, he actually, Cotillion here was very glad to have be reminded of humanity in a way. It's like he was distancing himself from it, but was glad to have her remind him of his almost obligation. Right. Panic broke in. Uncle, do you have any children? Cotillion winced and looked away. He said, a daughter of sorts. He sighed, then smiled wryly. He said, we had a falling out, I'm afraid. Panic said, you must forgive her. Cotillion exclaimed, damned upstart. <laughs> Panic said, you said we must teach each other, uncle. <laughs> nice. Man, you gotta, you gotta love kids. They sometimes tell it a little too straight, don't they? Yeah, you need it, though. Yep. They don't have the trappings of politeness or yeah. <laughs> rules in many I, cases. This, this is a non-smoking, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there are rules. There are rules. <laughs> 
Cotillion's eyes widened on the lad. Then he shook his head. He said, the forgiveness is the other way around, alas. Panic said, then I must meet her. Cotillion said, well, anything is possible. Apt spoke. Cotillion scowled and said, that lady was uncalled for. <laughs> I wish we knew what she was saying. <laughs> and that's yet another example of Mr. Erickson leaving enough unsaid for us to want more. Uh, yes, that, there's that light and devorousness we talk about. You know, it's just it's just so amazing, man. It, it's I, it, part of I think part of what bothers me so much nowadays within an entertainment in general is everyone feels obliged to have all of their questions answered. And mm -hmm. I so, and so, you know, over explaining things can really ruin good things when things are left mysterious. That's part of what makes it so good is that stuff that you're never going to know. <laughs> and, and we so desperately want to know, but we're not going to know. And that's what mm -hmm. makes it so good. <laughs> Let's the imagination run wild. Yes, it does. And that's why I think it's so brilliant. Mm -hmm. It's like, thank you for not over explaining things. <laughs> I'm a grown man. I can do that. I can think that through myself. <laughs> Cotillion turned away, wrapping his cloak about himself. After half a dozen strides, he paused and glanced back. He said, give Kalam my regards. A moment later, shadows engulfed him. Panic continued staring. He said, does he imagine that he now walks unseen? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> it's... <laughs> That's amazing, dude. That is too stinking funny that this kid's like, can you imagine that if there's some guy's like, okay, 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 okay. I'm really disappeared. If you'll just, if, okay, just turn around. Just, just, no, seriously, just, 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 just turn around. Oh, man. I just oh, made the God. connection in my mind to the Fun Times with Weapons episode in South Park <laughs> where Cartman thought he was invisible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's oh, really, oh, my good gracious. That's amazing. Yes. Yeah. I hope I don't connect that to this memory and I don't, I don't need that humor <laughs> on this, this screen here, but either way, oh. I'm really curious what all panic's vision is capable of seeing. Like, can he see through all glamors or is it just shadow aspect of stuff that he can see through? Oh, that's a good question. Being able to see through any glamors is one thing, but to see through something like this is a little more different, especially since it's done by like a direct source almost of this power in a way or someone who can wield the source directly or something you know, you know, you know does that make sense how i'm saying that it's like if if a guy that's a high practitioner of this field thinks he's hiding with using high magic and this kid like sees right through it they, I, I, this eye is amazing i mean full spectrum <laughs> makes predator vision look but real real silly <laughs> mm -hmm. we go to the rag stopper the greased anchor chain rattled smoothly, slipping down into the black, oily water, and Ragstopper came to a rest in Mala's Harbor, a hundred yards from the docks. A scatter of dull yellow lights marked the lower quarter's front street, where ancient warehouses interspersed by ramshackle taverns, inns and tenement houses faced the piers. To the north was the ridge that was home to the city's merchants and nobles, the larger estates abutting the cliff wall and its switchback stairs that ascended to Mox Hold. Few lights were visible in that old bastion, though Kalam could see a pennant flapping heavily in a high wind, too dark to make out its colors. A shiver of presentiment ran through Kalam at the sight of that pennant. He thought, someone's here, someone important. And quick reminder, Mox Hold is where we started the books out in the prologue for Gardens of the Moon. The crew were settling down behind Kalam, grumbling about the late hour of arrival, which would prevent them from immediately disembarking into the harbor streets. The harbor master would wait until the morrow before rowing out to inspect the craft and ensure that the sailors were hale, free of infections and the like. Being trapped on the vessel after being out to sea for that duration sucks. It's hard to describe that feeling of being so close to land but unable to leave the vessel just yet. And I was always eager to get off the boat and get back to my family, you know, and oh, you can just yeah. like taste it, but they're offloading all your equipment and stuff. You yeah. can't leave the boat yet. It's just terrible. <laughs> that would be awful. Yeah. You just wait, 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 hurry up and wait, hurry up and wait. Trying yeah. to get off and see those. Yeah. That's gotta be awful. The midnight bell had sounded only minutes earlier. Kalam thought sulky land judged rightly. Damn him. This stop in Malice City had never been part of the plan. Kalam had originally intended to await Fiddler in Unta where they would finalize the details. Quick Ben had insisted that the sapper could come through via Deadhouse, though the mage was typically evasive about specifics. <laughs> <laughs> 
naturally. Yes. Cagey. Yeah. yeah. Is cagey the correct word? <laughs> that absolutely encompasses quick bend. <laughs> Everything quick bend, yeah. Slippery also. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kalam had begun to view the dead house option as more of a potential escape route if things went wrong than anything else, and even then as a last recourse. He'd never liked the Azath, had no faith in anything that appeared so benign. Friendly traps were always far deadlier than openly belligerent ones. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I prefer the traps I can see as well. <laughs> yes, agreed. agreed. There was a silence behind him now, and Kalam briefly wondered at how swiftly sleep had come to the men sprawled on the main deck. Ragstopper was motionless, cordage and hull murmuring their usual natural noises. Kalam leaned on the forecastle rail, eyes on the city before him, on the dark bulks of ships resting in their berths. The Imperial Pier was off to his right, where the cliff face reached down to the sea. No craft was visible there. He thought to glance back up at the pennant's dark wing above the hold, but the effort seemed too much too dark in any case, and his imagination was ever fueled by thinking the worst of all he could not know. And now came sounds from farther out in the bay, another ship edging its way through the darkness, another late arrival. Kalam glanced down at his hands where they rested on the rail. They felt like someone else's, not his own, but the victims of someone else's will. He shook off the sensation. The island city's smells drifted out to him, the usual stench of the harbor, sewage warring with rot, brackish water of the sea mixing with a pungent whiff from the sluggish river that emptied into the bay. His eyes focused again on the dark, snag-toothed grin of the harbor front buildings. A few streets in, he knew, occupying one squalid corner amidst tenement blocks and fish stalls, stood the dead house, unmentioned and avoided by all denizens of the city, and to all outward appearances completely abandoned, its yard overgrown, its black, rough stones smothered in vines. No lights from the gaping windows in the Twin Towers. What, no squatters want to take a stab at occupying this place? <laughs> oh, man. Didn't you mention that you envisioned it being creepy like the house in It? Yeah, to some extent. I mean, this actually, it's kind of funny because here it's painted a little more benign. But yeah, I've always looked at it. For me, I find it very creepy. I guess just because of the otherworldly aspect and the fact that it is somehow aware or intelligent or something does the network of houses make up a brain of the universe or the multiverse mm, that would be crazy like each of them is a synapse or something yeah something like that that would mean a lot of different realms that you could go oh, to oh yeah now as in the it and wasteland question i have a question but is it do you think the house in it and wasteland are the same house i don't remember the wasteland house actually it's been a okay. long time since i read that that's where they pull the kid through yeah, I just remember the kid being lured into it, and he, he's like, I, know, I forget where they pull him out, but uh, just curious. Kalam thought, if anyone can make it, it's Fiddler. The mm. bastard's always been charmed, a sapper all his life, it seems, with a sapper's extra sense. What would he say if he stood here beside me right now? Don't like it, Cal. Something's awry, all right. Move those hands of yours. Kalam frowned, glanced back down at his hands, willing them to lift clear of the rail. Nothing. He attempted to step back, but his muscles refused, deaf to his command. Sweat sprang out beneath his clothes, beating the backs of his hands. A soft voice spoke beside him. There's such irony in this, my friend. You see, it's your mind that's betrayed you. The formidable, deadly mind of the assassin Kalam Mekar. Sulky Land leaned on the rail beside him, studying the city. He said, I've admired you for so long, you know. You're a damn legend, the finest killer the Claw ever had and lost. Ah, and it's that loss that rankles the most. Had you the will for it, Kalam, you could now be in command of the entire organization. Oh, Topper might disagree, and I'll grant you, in some ways, he's your superior by far. He would have killed me on the first day, no matter how uncertain he was of whatever risk I might have presented. Even so. Salkulan continued after a moment. Knife to knife, you're his better friend. Another irony for you, Kalam. I was not in Seven Cities to find you. Indeed, we knew nothing of your presence there. Until I came across a certain Redblade who did, that is. She'd been following you since Erlatan, before you delivered the book to Shaikh. Did you know you led the Redblades directly to that witch? Did you know that they succeeded in assassinating her? That Redblade would have been here with me, in fact, if not for an unfortunate incident in Erin. But I prefer working alone. Sulky Lan a name I admit to being proud of. But here and now, of course, my vanity insists that you know my true name, which is Pearl. 
That bastard. What a jerk. I really hate this guy. <laughs> yeah. I do not like him at all. No, Pompous. No. Arrogant. Yes. I know some of it's earned, okay? I will admit to some of it. <laughs> but here I'm just really ticked off. <laughs> Pearl paused, looked around, sighed. You threw me but once with that sly hint that maybe Quick Ben was hiding in your baggage. I almost panicked then until I realized if that were true, I'd already be dead, sniffed out and fed to the sharks. You should never have left the claw, Kalam. We don't deal with rejection very well. The Empress wants you, you know, wants a conversation with you, in fact, before skinning you alive, I imagine. Alas, things aren't so simple, are they? And so, here we are. In his peripheral vision, Kalam saw Pearl draw forth a dagger. Pearl continued, It's those immutable laws within the claw, you see. One in particular, which I'm sure you well know. The blade sank deep into Kalam's side with a dull, distant pain. Pearl withdrew the weapon. He said, oh, not fatal, just lots of blood. A weakening, if you will. Malice City is quiet tonight, don't you think? Not surprising. There's something in the air. Every cut purse, gutter snipe, and thug can feel it, and they're one and all keeping their heads low. Three hands await you, Kalam, eager for the hunt to start. That immutable law, Kalam, in the claw, we deal with our own. Oh, man. So it's an even fight then. <laughs> That's kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah. I'm as thinking. much as I hate to see Kalam get stabbed like this and knowing he's walking into a trap, I am amped up to see him go to work. It has been oh. too long. Yes, he's been kept restrained for a big chunk of time. And even when we've seen him in action, we've not seen him in action. It's just real quick. And so it happens so fast. Like, wait a minute, what? It just happens so quick. But I love that it takes this for Pearl. <laughs> okay, we are now at zero days. <laughs> Since... Hey, th are you, oh man, come on. Damn, come it. <laughs> no, it's okay, though. Like, we're starting to get to points where we can talk about more. Yeah. Now, I'm going to mix my stuff up here. This is not to downplay either one of the characters I'm bringing up, okay? I'm just asking a question. If possible to arrange the fight, who would you like to see win? Duncan Idaho or Kalam Meeker? You know, I've never been the biggest Duncan fan, so it's Kalam all day for me. Okay. okay. Yeah. I, I become a Duncan fan, you know, later when it gets really weird. But it requires that multiple year gap to get to the one I like. But I liked him originally. And I liked when they, I did, when the, the Dune prequel stuff, that was about the only thing I really enjoyed for some reason was Duncan's. I really, really liked Duncan's backstory for some reason. I don't know why. I was like, finally, some answers. Okay. And see, mm -hmm. I'm, talking, I'm complaining about answers. I finally have answers. But, you know, but I don't know why I like Duncan so much. I just, I don't know why. He's all right, but I don't love him like I love Kalam. I get that. I don't either. All of Erickson's human, I, I love a lot of characters from the late, great Frank Herbert. I mean, he had some great characters, but some of his side characters where you either loved them or you hate them, or they were just kind of side characters, you know? They were kind of like a deus ex machina. You know, they weren't ghosts in the machine per se, but they were there for present. You know, they kind of in a, in a way are. But, you know, Erickson just knows how to write people. They, that's just period. He writes the most human characters in the most unhuman world <laughs> hmm. that, that there is, you know, and it's just so fantastic, so beautifully done. I'm thinking of who I loved from the Dune series, and it was Paul and Chani. Those are like yeah. the two characters that I cared the most about. You're right. Me too. And I, I love the first trilogy in particular because I like the crazy stuff that happens to Leto, but it's like I'm still not emotionally invested in Leto. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, and then Aaliyah I mean, is just... Mm. <laughs> that could have been... that. Well, you know, and that could have been so much more in a way. You know, it's, I feel like there's a lot left hanging with that one. That could have been so much more exploited, shall we say, in a more vicious manner. That would have been like, ooh, that would be really troubling and more fitting of what's going on with inside of her. Yeah. Let's just put it this way. None of my children were in danger of being named after Duncan Idaho. So right, I got you. Okay, copy <laughs> I get you. Now, had I read these books before my yes. first son was born, I might have a, a bunch of bridge burners. You in would have a squad of bridge burners. In my crew. <laughs> Okay, 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 okay. So the, so the question is, I need I need you, sir, to look at your children, and next week, this is homework for you, I need to know who they are. That's not fair. I can't do that. <laughs> I can't do that. Okay. <laughs> well, my daughter is more of an Absalar than a bridge burner, to be honest with you. I mean, she's scary. Oh, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> there was a funny story from Mike and LP from Fry's 
Dallas, he said like when his, his daughter split her skull and they gave her staples, you know, mm-hmm. all she did was when she got the first one, did was it crying? And she looked at the doctor like, ow, mm-hmm. like just kind of, just kind of eyeballed that fellow like, man, ow, mm-hmm. what the crap, you know, like, huh, that could be problematic. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Pearl gripped Kalam and said, you'll awaken once you hit the water, friend. Granted, it's something of a swim, especially with the armor you're wearing. And the blood won't help. This bay's notorious for sharks, isn't it? But I've great confidence in you, Kalam. I know you'll make it to dry land. That far, at least. After that, well, smug bastard. This guy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Kalam felt himself being lifted, edged over the rail. He stared down at the black water below. Pearl gasped close to his ear. A damn shame about the captain and his crew, but I've no choice, as I'm sure you understand. Farewell, Kalam Makar. Kalam struck the water with a soft splash. Pearl stared down as the disturbance settled. His confidence in Kalam wavered. The man was in chain armor, after all. Then he shrugged, drew forth a pair of throat stickers, and swung to face the motionless figures lying on the main deck. He said, a good man's work is never done, alas. He stepped forward. The shape that emerged from the shadows to face him was huge, angular, black-limbed. A single eye gleamed from the long-snouted head, and hovering dimly behind that head was a rider, his face a mockery of his mounts. Pearl stepped back, offered a smile. He said, Ah, an opportunity to thank you for your efforts against the Semk. I knew not where you came from then, nor how you've come to be here now, or why, but please accept my gratitude. The rider, who we know is Panic, said, Kalam. He was here but a moment ago. Pearl's eyes narrowed. He said, ah, now I understand. You weren't following me, were you? No, of course not. How silly of me. Well, to answer your question, child, Kalam has gone into the city. The demon's lunge interrupted him. Pearl ducked beneath the snapping jaws and directly into the sweeping foreclaw. The impact threw him 20 feet, crashing him up against a battened down dory. His shoulder dislocated with a stab of pain. Pearl rolled, forcing himself into a sitting position. He watched the demon stalk toward him. Pearl whispered, I see I've met my match. Very well. He reached under his shirt and said, try this one then. The tiny bottle shattered on the deck between them. Smoke billowed, began coalescing. Pearl went on. The Kenrila looks eager, wouldn't you say? Well, he struggled to his feet and said, I think I'll leave you two to it. There's a certain tavern in Malice City I've been dying to see. He gestured and a warren opened, swept over him, and when it closed, Pearl was gone. Apt watched the Imperial Demon acquire its form, a creature twice its weight, hulking and bestial. Panic reached down and patted Apt's lone shoulder. He said, let's be quick with this one, shall we? (laughs) Dude, the confidence. Let's talk about escalation for a moment. (laughs) Yes, yes. You may recall the rooftop fight in Darujistan between Kalam, Quick Ben, and the Tist Andy assassins. Yes, one of, if not one of my favorite scenes in the book, in that mm-hmm. book. Yeah, the last time we got to see Kalam truly work. Yes. I recall. Yes. The Imperial Demon Quick Ben summoned was named Pearl, confusingly. <laughs> yes. The way Pearl was presented, I got the impression that he, question mark, was immensely powerful. Well, me too. I mean, I that's portrayed as just you know he unfortunately had just met the fellow that was you know magnitudes of power more powerful than him but yeah i assume this guy could destroy a city is how it's portrayed yeah heck even the small one that rake put his boot on was seen as strong enough to take out the region stand by itself wasn't it exactly that's what's going to be my next point that dog like one yeah that- <laughs> it was yeah. like i'll destroy this whole city I'll de- <laughs> <laughs> and then he gets a boot on the back of his head and he's like oh, master <laughs> yes, yes yeah that guy was saying he could destroy the whole city and yes. i got the impression that the kenrila demons were more powerful than something like that yes so now another one shows up and it appears that it's no match for apt and this yeah. makes me think that the power levels have climbed yet again. I want you to think about the Easter eggs that we've had dropped about out. We covered a couple of them here just a minute ago. She was a demon king or some type of demon ruler's concubine, correct? Mm-hmm. Is, yeah. is a hint. Pretty big schemer. Hinted at also with the demon ruler. And look at look at what she's done to Panak here. Uh, Whatever is going on here. It may just be simple compassion i kind of i'm I'm reading the panic situation as a compassion issue Mm -hmm. but and she seems to also like slash love kalam (laughs) (laughs) she also back talks shadow through and leaves him open mouth in her boldness and and, and likewise with cotillion Mm -hmm. 
I mean, what is she? She must be very powerful indeed. Wasn't there some guess that she was enslaved by Shaikh? Yeah, I, it said enslaved, yes, but was that ever proven or was she just had nothing better to do that a couple of years, I mean, these things, I'm assuming she's probably immortal as well to some extent or long, long, long lived, either one. And yeah, I don't think we ever get an answer to how she ended up under Shaikh's care. She was wandering across the desert. And yeah. then the next time we see she's there with the original Shaikh. Yes. And when Kalam delivers the book of Drajna, then. Was she just waiting for Kalam and the book this whole time? I don't know. But, but Shaikh ordered Apt to go with Kalam and protect That's him. That's true. That's true. But would Apt have done it anyhow? Just maybe it appeared that she was following Shaikh's orders, but she might have maybe her orders suited her. We'll never know. Yeah, we won't get an answer to that. I would just have to assume that whatever Shaikh was doing suited Apt's purposes. Or Shaikh is that much more powerful and has the ability yeah. to tell her what to do. That's also another possibility. That's a very big possibility in this world. That spear that she drove into the sky to show the apocalypse, that's pretty and, impressive. Yeah, especially because it's new Shaikh. But mm -hmm. she's still not, you know, I, I assume there is a transition period where you, you know, you got to learn who's who and what's what. You know, with with the body you're inhabiting mm. or what, I, whatever goes on there, I got no idea, man. Yeah, <laughs> but we can agree there's been an escalation again. At the escalation. Point. Yes. Agreed. <laughs> well done. Thank you, sir. A chorus of shutters and explosions of wood awoke the captain. He blinked in the darkness as Ragstopper pitched wildly about him. Voices screamed on deck. Groaning, the captain pushed himself off the bed, sensing a clarity in his mind that he'd not known in months a freedom of action and thought that told unequivocally that Pearl's influence was gone. I guess that's confirmation that Pearl can use the warn of Makra. Would you agree with that? Yes. And what a dangerous opponent this makes Pearl. I mean, he's obviously a good assassin. He ain't Kalamekar, but I mean, he's a good assassin. But throw this in there, that does make him formidable. Yeah. Because he could have dispatched anybody he wanted to a minute ago. Yes, that's true. Even Kalam, in that case, nothing going yes. to stop them. Yeah, nothing going to stop that. O only apps appropriate. And uh, it just, I'm curious why. Why did Pearl do that? Why did he let him go? Because he wants the claw to deal with him. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Maybe we want to see him work one last time. You know. Hey, I'm dying to see this fella get to work. <laughs> get the weak ones culled out of the ranks, maybe. <laughs> yeah. The captain clambered to his cabin door, limbs weak with disuse, and made his way into the passage. Emerging on deck, he found himself in a crowd of cowering sailors. Two horrific creatures were battling directly in front of them, the larger of the two a mass of shredded flesh unable to match its opponent's lightning speed. Its wild flailing with a massive double-bladed axe had reduced the deck and the rails to pulp. An earlier swing had chopped through the mast, and though it remained upright, snagged in cordage somewhere high above them, it leaned precariously, its weight canting the ship hard over. Man, what a mess they're making of the rag stopper. I know it, and I'm starting to like this ship like I like most of the horses in this book. Not yeah. the ship, man, please leave me. <laughs> yeah, it had quite the personality. <laughs> yes. Someone shouted, Captain! The captain shouted, Have the lads drag the surviving dories clear, Pallet, and back up astern. We'll lower him from there. Pallet shouted, aye, sir. The acting first mate snapped out the commands, then swung back to offer the captain a grin. He said, glad you're back, Carthair. The captain, who we now know is Carthair and Crust, said, shut your face, Pallet. That's Malice City out there, and I drowned years ago, remember? Another member of the old guard who, quote, unquote, died, appears. Yeah. I yeah. wonder who else isn't dead. They keep showing up. They do keep showing up. And I love the fact that the rumor that he couldn't come up with a better one than drowning in the hall. Come on, man. <laughs> Sailor drown. <laughs> it's lazy. It's lazy. It's lazy, Cartheron. Come on. <laughs> but it apparently worked. I mean. <laughs> yeah. Cartheron squinted at the warring demons. He said, Ragstopper's not going to survive this. Pallet said, but the loot. Cartheron shouted, to hood with that. We can always raise her, but we need to be alive to do it. Now let's lend a hand with those dories. We're taking on water and going down fast. Pallet said, Beru Fend, the sea's crawling with sharks. And that doesn't bode well for Kalam on his swim. Yeah, I almost feel bad for the sharks. <laughs> um, uh, that would be uh, tough to swim with that chain. Oh, down. my word. Oh, good gracious. And him going into the sea, all this whole stuff here in the harbor is core memory for me. 
just absolute core memory. But what I think is quite funny, the way Pallet says, but the loot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Has Carter on this whole time that he snook or pour him qual out of this money? Somehow he was going to like, okay, I'm going to work my way in here. We're going to steal this money right out from under this idiot's nose. You know, it's like, that'd be hilarious. I could totally, I feel like that's probably, I, I don't know why I feel like that's like, it's been the plan all along <laughs> for these guys. Don't worry about it. We'll, we'll get it out of the water later. Come on. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> get back. Entirely plausible. Yep. 50 yards farther out, the captain of the fast trader stood with his first mate, both of them straining to make out the source of the commotion ahead. The captain said, back oars, full stop. The first mate said, aye, sir. The captain said, that ship's going down. Assemble rescue crews. Lower the boats. Horse hooves clomped on the main deck behind them. Both men turned. The first mate stepped forward and shouted, you there. What in male's name do you think you're doing? How did you get that damned animal on deck? Quick reminder, male is the god of the seas. The woman tightened the girth strap another notch, then swung up into the saddle. She said, I'm sorry, but I cannot wait. Sailors and marines scattered as she drove the horse forward. The creature cleared the side rail and leapt out into darkness. A loud splash followed a moment later. The first mate turned back to his captain, jaw hanging. The captain snapped, get ship's mage and a goat. (laughs) The first mate said, sir? The captain said, anyone brave and stupid enough to do what she just did has earned our every assistance. Have ship's mage clear the path through the sharks and whatever else might await her. Be quick about it. What does that have to do with the goat? I'm assuming if you get the ship's mage and the goat, there's some kind of blood sacrifice here. And blood, we know the elders like the blood sacrifices. Okay, maybe. Uh, but, those poor but, goats. but but also, it could, maybe it's just easy if you chum the water. It draws the, mm. it draws the sharks to the preferred item as opposed, and maybe it draws them away from the people going in the water. Yeah, maybe. probably that. Yeah. Hopefully. Uh, maybe, no, actually, it's probably both because he's asking for the mage specifically. Any of them could have cut the goat's yes. throat and thrown it overboard. Right. So, yeah, there's got to be something with an offering or something. And uh, both. Uh, who knows? We'll figure that out. Yeah. Or we won't. <laughs> <laughs> and thus the chapter ends. Man, wow. action-packed, tension-filled. What a chapter. Dude. Really, yeah, very action-filled. Great. What an amazing chapter. For standout moments. The refugee train making it to Aaron successfully. That was quite an accomplishment. Quite a relief Mm -hmm. to get these, get these refugees in there and, and, you know, at a horrible cost, I'm you know, we haven't heard yet officially, but we're only, we can always assume that Coltane is of course dead because how else would these people have made it to the city safely? No signs indicating that he's alive. Yeah. Keneb showing up as a city guard was nice. Yes, very nice. and I, I, Great to see a familiar face. Yeah, I like him. The conversation between Panic and Cotillion. I really enjoyed seeing the human side of Cotillion starting to come out. Yeah, yeah, I, I really enjoyed seeing his humanity reawaken, as it were. It's really kind of cool. This is the start of the, I think, as we've mentioned, this is the start of the Cotillion we like a lot. Mm-hmm. As opposed to the bloodthirsty, vengeance-driven. Which we which we never met technically. Right. You know, we, we, us, we, we met them. We're not doing things, just looking surly in a corner. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. I enjoyed panic telling Cotillion what to do and Cotillion's reactions were beautiful. <laughs> Very beautiful. It's, he, he seemed, he seemed to enjoy having that little kid around to talk to for a minute there. Mm-hmm. He was kind of reluctant at first, but then he, mm-hmm. he got into it. Yeah. Yeah. Panic's ability to see Cotillion while he was in read and shadow was interesting. That and yeah, all the and, and seeing things, the ruins of the realm that used to exist mm-hmm. there that that the people that now live here can't see get out of here. That's pretty wild. Yeah, he called it the hold. So that makes me think that this is a fragment of the hold of shadow. Yeah, yeah, that's what that, that's what I'm getting. Yeah, Pearl's treachery being exposed as he froze Kalam in place and stabbed him. Mm-hmm. You know, at least we finally got that sequence over yeah. the mind bending, confusion riddled sea yes. trip. And what a jerk and a coward. Smart, but kind of crappy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just just to even the odds, because that's what is, you should have brought more. Yeah. Even these odds, I think. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking forward to that fight between Kalam and the claw that await him. Mm. Yes. Let that man work. Yes. <laughs> Panic's confidence that they can easily dispatch the Kenrilla demon summoned by Pearl. And apparently rightly so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it looked like App was just like going to town on that fellow. With Panic riding her back. Riding on, <laughs> exactly. Crazy. Just riding on his back. 
That's too funny. And then confirmation that Pearl was using Makra and that Cartharian crust is actually alive. Yes. Finally, I love that. And Kalal being stabbed and thrown in the bay again is, in particular, this stuff at the end part of this chapter in the bay. I guess it's because we're getting close to something just like they did in gardens. You know, Erickson does have a way he builds that I appreciate and like. And as we get here, you know, it's like we've survived one grueling encounter that's been the book long, and that was the chain. And so the people that survived the chain were finally got that kind of through and over with. And that's thank goodness for that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but now we've survived that just to get into this. Now we have another ordeal awaiting us next week. It's a different ordeal. Yeah. <laughs> so beautifully done. Such beautiful escalation, but such core. I always have those parts brought before the end as core memories. Cause it's always the setup for the, the last the culmination like, oh, of everything we've been building. We it's like, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. It's like, yep. <laughs> Finally, Minala jumping the stallion overboard to make it ashore and follow Kalam. What a mad woman. Mm, absolutely magnificent mad woman. Agreed. All right. Great job tonight, Billy. Oh, man. Hey, great episode. You got any final thoughts before we drop off here? Yeah. I just keep getting more and more excited as we get so close to the end of this amazing books, man. Just awesome. Yeah. Great episode. Fantastic. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. Hey, we'll see you all next week. We thank you all for joining us today. Again, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us, and we've had a really great time talking about the topic today. If you would like to support our show, you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com, where you can find our Patreon link. Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com.